This is Brian Schwartz with the University of California, San Francisco. I'm an infectious diseases doctor, uh, caring for patients with a wide array of infectious diseases. Um, this session today is going to be an overview of clinical infectious diseases with a focus on the epidemiology of infectious diseases. Our learning objectives today, one, understand the differences between colonization and infection with pathogens. Two, recognize the different interplays between humans and microorganisms. Three, know that infection is an important cause of mortality worldwide. Four, describe the key mechanisms of transmission of infection. And five, recognize the differences between community and healthcare or hospital-acquired infections. So I'm going to start by talking about the interaction between humans and microorganisms. And I think a lot of you probably have a general understanding about this. Um, but, you know, when we talk about um, bacteria or other microorganisms, we're often focusing on the idea that bugs are bad and that bugs cause disease. And the truth of the matter is, is that they, for the most part, don't. And most of the bacteria that we encounter in our lives are harmless. Some of them can cause disease. For example, the image that I show here is that of Staphylococcus aureus, um, which is a pathogen that probably most of you have heard about. You've heard about staph infections before. But it's important to start by remembering that staph actually lives in the nose, for example, of over 30% of folks, but causes infection, like over here in this image of a um, skin infection, in very few people. Although many of you probably have encountered having a small abscess before, um, but for the most part, when staph lives on people, it just lives in this state of what we call colonization, kind of lives without causing disease. So let's talk a little bit more about this idea of colonization. So this is a state where organisms will live on the host, but do not cause any harm. And we have actually more bacterial cells on us than we actually have human cells in us. And that is a ratio of 10 to one. So where are they living? Well, they're living in our nose, they're living in our mouth, they're living all over our skin, they're living in the uh, genital urinary tract, particularly the vagina, and a lot of them are living in the GI tract. We have a huge amount of uh, bacteria, a very diverse uh, flora of, of bacteria in there. And when I use the term flora, actually you may have heard of the term normal flora, but there is the type of bacteria that lives on us normally is we refer to as our normal flora. So that is bacteria living in a state of colonization, not causing any disease. And, but then we gotta think about bacteria can cause disease and it can be pathogenic, so capable of causing clinical disease. Um, and it can do that in a local state. So as we should, talked about before, Staphylococcus aureus can cause, uh, in someone who's had a break in the skin, it can cause an abscess, as you can see this image here. It's causing local redness, pain, swelling, inflammation. This is a local infection with Staphylococcus aureus. Bacteria can also cause systemic infection. So it can get outside one localized area and cause infection throughout the body. And this is a, an unfortunate child who has sepsis, which we, um, um, is a, a disease of systemic kind of over response of the inflammatory system uh, due to Neisseria meningitidis infection. Uh, Neisseria meningitidis is a common cause of meningitis, not surprising by the name. Um, and um, but it can also cause what we call meningiococcemia, or where the bacteria is, goes all throughout the body. It is, has a very high mortality rate associated with it and um, can be very severe. You can see in this young child, the disease has caused necrosis or death of the skin and the legs and the hands. Um, and when the disease is like this, as I said, the mortality rate can be very high. Another way that bacteria or other types of organisms, viruses, uh, for example, can live is in a state of latency. And what latency is, the ability of a organism to lie dormant after it causes infection. So the image here is a patient who has a chest x-ray following a tuberculosis infection. A lot of you have heard of TB or tuberculosis infection from Mycobacterium 
uh, tuberculosis, you inhale the bacteria and it can uh, cause an area of infection, but often the immune system is able to wall it off. And what you can see here where the arrow is on the chest x-ray is an area of bright white, which is actually calcification, suggestion of prior inflammation um, that was controlled. And you know, for the most part, most patients who have these very um, these types of infections will not go on to develop disease later. Um, however, reactivation of this latency can occur, particularly when you have a suppression of the immune system. For example, somebody who was infected with HIV, developed AIDS, who had tuberculosis infection that was walled off by the immune system 25 years before could now reactivate and cause very severe um, tuberculosis infection in the lungs and disseminate to other parts of the body. Besides tuberculosis, fungi can do this, You'll uh, histoplasmosis, virus can do this, a lot of the herpes viruses, um, and then protozoa like leishmaniasis, and helminths or worms like strongyloides uh, can do this, and you'll probably hear about this in other um, uh, sections of your course. I kind of mentioned certain organisms are colonizers, certain organisms are pathogens, and, and they don't necessarily need to be just one or the other, um, but there, I kind of divide them into certain groups. So for example, there are certain organisms that are predominantly colonizers and rarely can become pathogens. For example, Staphylococcus epidermidis. Not surprisingly, this is a, a form of staph that lives on the skin, epidermis. Um, and it, it predominantly is not a cause of disease. However, in this x-ray is a person who has had a knee replacement. And when you uh, put a foreign body or an artificial knee in place, there when staph epidermidis gets in, it can cling and uh, form biofilms on the prosthetic material and actually can cause infection. But for the most part, it really doesn't. There's organisms that live on or in us and then are actually common pathogens. So another example is, is E. coli. E. coli lives in our gut, we all have it, um, and living in our gut really doesn't cause any problems. However, when it gets into other parts of the body, that's when you worry about it causing disease. It's actually the most common cause of urinary tract infections. So when it gets into the bladder, E. coli can cause infection, um, whereas most of the time it just lives in the GI tract and doesn't. Then there's some that are predominantly just pathogens and don't really have a state of colonization. And I think the influenza virus is a good example of that. Most people who get influenza virus are gonna be ill. Um, and then there's these other types of pathogens that are really only pathogenic to immunocompromised patients. We often term these as opportunistic infections. Um, and probably the one that you may have heard the most about is in patients with HIV is pneumocystis girovecii. Um, previously known as pneumocystis carinii or PCP. Um, and that was one of the first types of infections that were identified uh, in the 80s in patients who had AIDS and HIV was they were coming down with this uh, type of infection that normal hosts would not get. We'll talk a little bit more about the burden of infectious diseases worldwide. Well, if you look at the WHO uh, list of what are the top 10 causes of death worldwide, you can see that three of them are infections. So um, number four altogether is pneumonia or respiratory tract infections, followed by HIV AIDS and then diarrheal diseases. So you can see that the burden of disease is quite significant. How do you get infections? Well, there's three main ways that I like to think about people getting infections. You can either get it from another human, so human to human transmission. You could have transmission from another species that's not a human, and then you can get it from the environment. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. So human to human transmission, some examples of that would be getting it from respiratory droplets. So for example, if I had tuberculosis or influenza, I would my disease might be transmissible to you if we were in close contact with each other. Uh, there are bloodborne infections. If I had hepatitis C or HIV and we were intravenous drug users or I gave you a blood transfusion, you could get an infection for me that way. You can transmit infection through the maternal fetal route, uh, things like syphilis. Um, or Chagas disease uh, can be transmitted from mother to infant. There's the oral fecal route, so probably the one that you most common with are things like traveler's diarrhea, but things like hepatitis A or norovirus, those are two viruses can be transmitted through contaminated food or water. 
and then sex, herpes simplex virus, um, particularly herpes simplex virus type 2 can be transmitted through sex, HIV, syphilis. So you can see we've talked about HIV and syphilis as, uh, as being transmitted by other ways as well. So these are just some examples of ways transmission can occur. So how about from other species uh, to human? So insects, mosquitoes, uh, you guys are probably all familiar with mosquitoes, can transmit malaria. Uh, flies, particularly the sand fly, can transmit leishmaniasis. Ticks can transmit Lyme disease. And then animals can also, so rabies, so we've all read Old Yeller, um, can trans, uh, dogs, bats, and I have an example here is of a bat, but that's one, actually one of the more common causes of rabies transmission in the U.S. Reptiles like turtles and lizards, snakes can transmit salmonella, and birds uh, can carry and transmit cryptococcus, which is a fungal infection that patients who are immunocompromised can get. And then I said environment uh, can carry infection. So this is an example of construction workers who are exposed to soil that's contaminated with coccidioides imidis. So this is a uh, fungus that lives in Arizona and Central Valley of California. And when it's brushed up in the dirt, it can be inhaled and can cause very severe infection, um, often called valley fever. The other last thing that I wanted to mention was um, thinking about the differentiation uh, between community and healthcare associated or nosocomial infection. So the term nosocomial or healthcare associated are often used interchangeably. And there's some ways that you want to think about these differently. So nosocomial or healthcare associated pathogens are often different in type. So for example, the most common cause of pneumonia in a normal uh, adult in the community is streptococcus pneumoniae. However, one of the most common causes in the healthcare setting is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So the bugs are different. And then also, because these bugs tend to be exposed to different antibiotics, they tend to be more resistant. So for example, if somebody in the community had a urinary tract infection, we've talked about before that E. coli, which normally lives in your gut, um, can cause urinary tract infections. Usually it's in the community susceptible to ceftriaxone, which is a commonly used antibiotic. However, if it's acquired in the hospital, that E. coli might have been exposed to other antibiotics and develop resistance. So nosocomial urinary tract infections with E. coli may be ceftriaxone resistant. So I hope that uh, this has been a helpful overview um, or introduction to clinical infectious diseases.